important, but the Bible teaches you something that's imperative in a time like this. A time like this, you can get so focused, you can get so uh, 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 tunnel visioned on what's going on in the world that you get to thinking about it all the time and it increases your anxiety because your frustration is there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, they tell you to stay at home. They say, don't stay at home. They say, get in the sunlight. Don't get in the sunlight. They say, uh, you know, you should sit down, but don't sit too long. And if you sit down, wipe down. And if you don't wipe down, man, get back up and take your clothes off. Wash your clothes. Uh, make sure you wash them in this and wash them in that. And, and there's all kind of natural remedies out. And there's all kind of people saying things. And what that does is create confusion if you can't compartmentalize it. I'm not telling you, and it's ridiculous for me to tell you, don't watch the news. Because you're going to watch the news and watch the afternoon pressers. And what are they saying this week? The same thing they said last week. Because there's a lot about this they don't know. I don't know what it is. I can't get any light on it. It's just some of the things about it don't make a lot of sense to me. But my issue is in the spiritual realm. What interrupts my fellowship with Jesus Christ? There's where the problem is. There's where the focus for the Christian needs to be. What is it that interrupts my fellowship with Jesus Christ? Well, I would imagine now your anxiety levels are going up if you haven't got your stimulus check or whatever may be coming in the mail or you didn't get what you think you should have gotten or you've been laid off or furloughed. And, you know, it's easy, as a friend of mine told me, if you're working for the government, you're still getting paid. But if you've lost your job, like 30 million something people have or whatever the numbers are now, and you've got mortgages to pay and car payments to pay and electric to pay, and water to pay and food on the table and medical bills and all that, all of a sudden the anxiety goes up and then you're ready to get back to work and they're saying, well, you can't go to work. And then you're thinking, well, if I go back to work, am I even going to have a job to work with? And if they're going to pay me, is the money going to be worth anything when they pay me? And what about this and what about that? And I'm not going to pay my mortgage and they're going to give me a bump down to the end, but they're probably going to charge me extra interest on it and they're going to forgive me of my car loan, but only a tag that on the end. And so the anxiety begins to rise. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I'm here to deal with you and from a spiritual perspective. And that interrupts your fellowship with Jesus Christ. You say, why? That song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. That's very, very uh, profound statement. Full means he has my full attention. It means I'm paying attention. I realize I walk circumspectly. I realize I don't have my head in the sand. I realize I pay attention. But ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand something. I got to keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. There is nothing happening. And it isn't just to crash the United States economy that they crash the entire world. There's something bigger than you and I and that anybody can figure out what it is. Whether or not the, the, the Antichrist is going to use it as part of his final system. Okay, great. Could be. I wish he'd show up so I can get out of here. But here's the bottom line. If the anxiety around the things of the world have now flooded my mind to the point that I can't keep my fellowship with Jesus Christ, it's as much as a sin as you doing things you shouldn't be doing. You say, why? Because he doesn't have, he's not possessing your vessel fully. Look, if you will, please, he warns you, evil communications in, in Corinthians corrupt good manners. Evil communications can come out of a preacher's mouth. Evil communications can come from people that are indecisive. They don't know what to do, where to do, and what to, what's going on. Um, our purview here, we're in church. We're not in a political arena. We're not in a physical arena. We're in a spiritual arena. The main focal point of what ought to be here is you and your relationship to Jesus Christ. What a great thing has happened and thanking God for the virus for the last five, six weeks or it was here before Christmas time. It was here back in February of last year. It was here for this and that. Okay, whatever it was here. What a great time for us to see how little it takes for us to get our eyes off of Jesus Christ. What a little thing it takes for us to recognize how quickly we're turning on the news instead of picking up the Bible. How quickly we are to pick up the phone and to send out the emails and to send out the Facebook posts and to send out our opinion on a YouTube video. We are instead of spending some time with the Lord in prayer. How, how big it is for us now that everybody has opinion that matters and everybody gets out there and they got to put their stuff on their phone and send it to everybody and give their opinion, which don't amount to a row of pins. You have experts all over the world saying it's this, and then another expert, and it's that. It's like court that I used to be involved in. Uh, our side calls an expert, and they come in and testify to the DNA evidence. Their side comes in and testify to the negativity of DNA evidence, and they can't prove within a, a shadow of a doubt that it's this and that and the other. And now you've got the same thing. Two experts saying one says it's good, one says it's bad. Which is it? 
You have the same thing going on right now. The devil's real good at creating confusion. You say what? Yea, hath God said? Is that what God really said? Is that what He meant? I mean, I know He said that, but is that what He meant by what He said? Because what I think He said was, and what I think He meant was, uh, not just a political faux pas, not just sarcasm, not just a misstep or a misspoke. No, intentionally creating confusion. Watch. God is not the author of confusion, right? I heard some of you through the television screen there. You don't know we're watching you on the other end. God's not the author of confusion. Well, then who would be the exact opposite? People have a misconception when it comes to this passage I'll deal with in just a minute in Timothy. They take a look at that passage in Timothy and then the question comes up and the, the Bible says there, who may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him is a will. They say, well, can the devil repent? No. You say, why? He won't acknowledge the truth. The truth is the thing that sets you free, the absolute truth. I don't know if the people in the news media or the people that are supposed to be in the know are telling you the truth or if they think they're telling you a lie to protect you from the truth because you can't handle the truth and, and all that other kind of stuff. I couldn't tell you. I can tell you the Bible's true. I can tell you this, and I'm positive. I'll create a little bit of a stir by what I'm about to say. I'm seeing a lot of preachers right now who are becoming experts in medical things. They're becoming experts in political things. They're becoming experts in end of the world and end of times and all that stuff. And they've strayed away from the Bible. They're not preaching the Bible from a practical standpoint. They're preaching all these odd, weird, unusual things of how the devil's going to use this to get you vaccinated and get the grain of rice in your skin or to have a tattoo in you so that now because it's the mark of the beast and all that. Okay, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I'm not going to be here for the tribulation. Well, now, preacher, I know they've always said that, but you old timers believe that pre-tribulation rapture stuff. And I'm kind of thinking we're going to be here. I mean, after all, uh, this is pretty bad. Pretty bad? Pretty bad. You had nearly 7 million people in 1917, 1918 of Americans, not worldwide, nearly 7 million people that died. And this is bad. I'm not making comparison. I realize one's not a bad, bad enough and I, I understand that and I believe whatever it is, it's the real deal. Don't make the comparison. Well, it's just a cough. It's just a cold. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about how easy it is for us as Christians to all of a sudden finally have a trial of our faith come in and see how quickly our minds get distracted from what matters the most. What matters the most, the Lord says to the Apostle Paul, with food and raiment, therewith be content. And you know what happens? We begin to think, well, my, my lifestyle's been disruptive. Well, that's how it is in the rest of the world. They wake up one morning, there's no power, there's no water, and a political announcement that comes out that says we're shutting this down and shutting that down, and we're closing the stores down and we're doing that. That's a regular thing. You just haven't seen that happen here since back in the 1800s when the Civil War was going on. When you had all the things that were happening on your soil and the, during the time of the Civil War and then having the rolling blackouts during different times of, of power outages and stuff and going through the missile crisis and the Bay of Pigs and, and going through Vietnam and Korea and World War I and World War II and, and those kind of things. But all that stuff's on foreign soil. And so now what you have is, is you have something that's making people really sick. And whether you say, well, I think they're lying or not lying, that's not the point. Maybe they're lying. Maybe they're just bald-faced lying. The issue is, have you kept your mind stayed on Jesus Christ? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know what he tells you or he tries to teach you? He tries to teach, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Yeah, but Lord, did you see what's happened? That's what got Pete in trouble. Pete's out there walking to the Lord on the water. I don't know how far he walked, but all of a sudden he started looking around him and going, man, look at the waves. The Bible says tempest. Look at the wind and, and the results of the wind. And look at that lightning cutting across that thing like a laser beam light show. <laughs> and then look at the clouds. And, and the next thing you know, what happened to him? You say, well, he's looking at the tempest. You missed it. No, he was, see, he was looking at the waves. Peter was looking at the trouble as has been preached on a regular basis. He got to looking so much at his trouble. No, but you still missed it. The most important thing is, is first, before he looked at his troubles, he took his eyes off Jesus. That's the thing you got to understand. This is an effort on the part of demonic entities to see whether or not you're going to keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, listen, I didn't say the demonic entities created it or caused it. I didn't say it was created in Wuhan or it was created in, you know, the, in the Chernobyl or it was created in Japan or, or somebody who's trying to infiltrate us or take over the world and it's the Illuminati and it's the AFL-CIO and, and it's uh, the, the Bilderbergers and it's the 33rd degree Masons and, and, and all that other kind of stuff with all 
I didn't say it was any of that. I said, the incident has occurred, where are your eyes? Whatever the incident is, what are you looking at? Well, preacher, I looked at the news and preacher, I was watching the thing and I was reading this report and reading that report and reading this one and I, I read this news circuit and I read that. You know, I've been watching YouTube and I've been watching this and I, and I saw that and I saw this and that and the other and this guy over here said and this guy over here. I just, I, I just, I don't, evil communications corrupt good manners. What's a good manner? Keep your eyes on Jesus. I got no way to tell you. People tell me there's going to be a monetary impact like this country's never seen. Big headlines come out. Fear mongering. What does it say? We are in a time period that's greater than the Great Depression. Well, most of the people they're talking to don't even remember or know anything about the Great Depression except what they might have read in a history book. That doesn't have any impact. You talk to kids nowadays and ask them about 9-11. They're like, what? What is 9-11? What is you talk to them about Vietnam, with the exception of the veterans that are still around and still remain, the ones that Agent Orange hadn't killed off and all the other kind of stuff. You talk to them, except for those people, nobody hardly remembers that anymore. Nowadays, you're out in 2020 and you're saying to individuals, you know, yeah, well, but, but, but preacher, this is a time worse than the plague in 17 and 18. I wasn't even alive there. I can't relate to that. I don't even know what it is. What about the depression? I wasn't alive. But they put that out there and then you think, well, is that politically motivated? Did they really tell them the truth? Well, is that truth? I mean, if they put it on the Internet, it must be true. That's like saying the stuff you post on Facebook is true all the time. And you know, Bible believer or not, that you kind of shade things just a little bit. You know, for, so for the very idea that you think they're being held accountable, they're talking heads, they're pundits. They're paid to talk. They're paid to keep the balloon in the air. Just keep pumping it up. The helium ran out and they just got to keep bumping it up, bumping it up. So they're talking. You think because they're talking, they know something. That doesn't mean they know anything. That's why church becomes hugely important. You say, why? God gave you a Bible to be able to look at when a preacher's talking to you. And you ought to be able to sniff those individuals out. I mean, within five minutes, you ought to say, nah, that, ain't, don't ring, that don't ring right like we saw, really say it down here in the South. Look at this thing in Philippians. Brother, will you turn the air conditioner on, please? I'm burning up already. Must be that coffee Miss Amy brought me. Look, if you will, please, and y'all will regret that in the service. Look in verse number uh, five. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. 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 What does that mean? It means be careful for nothing. Don't worry so much about everything. Yeah, well, preacher, what? I mean, what if I can't get the medical attention? And what if I can't get to the doctor? And oh, what if I can't get my medicine? And what if I can't get gasoline? <laughs> oh, you got gasoline running out your ears now. A great time to go fill your tanks up and stuff the one you got in the ground full of gasoline. You say, well, you can buy it in some places for less than a dollar a gallon. Uh, some friends of mine up in northern Michigan and stuff up there, man, it's already under uh, a gallon. Up, I mean, already under a dollar a gallon there. Around here, you're seeing prices for gasoline that these kids have never seen. Be careful for nothing, but he says right there. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. But in everything, he says, by prayer and supplication. I'm going to the Lord in prayer. You know what he tells me to do? I'm to pray about what's going on, but I'm supposed to, in the meantime, thank God for the trouble. Thank God for the cancer. Thank God for the loss of the kid. Thank God for the loss of a, another loved one. Thank God for the coronavirus. Somebody sent me a thing not long ago, Corona Begona kind of a deal. And then they turned it into a, a rock and roll show and a church service and that kind of thing. Like you, if you speak it into existence, it's going to cause you to, to be able to kill it. And then a pope running around like a fool with a half a grapefruit on his head, running over there and, and blessing places and stuff like that. And then having the audacity to make this statement, uh, God's not going to forgive us our sins against nature. That started in Genesis 3, with all due respect, stupid, you don't read your Bible. You claim to be an expert. You claim to be the vicar of Christ. You claim to be the spokesman for Jesus on earth. You claim to be almost the same as Jesus Christ on earth. And you don't know that thing started in Genesis chapter 3. You don't know that when man sinned, as a result, it wasn't his sin against nature wasn't his sin against uh, closing off the ozone and spraying hairspray or having a car that has exhaust and the CO2 emissions and, and your CO2 f footprint and had nothing to do with that. Had nothing to do with your sin against nature or your sin against each other. It has to do with your sin against God. And judgment comes. You say, why? All the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. You know, God bless America, my foot. God's not blessing America. If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and repent and, and turn their faces unto me, then I will bless. That's the nation of Israel. 
This nation can't even get on the same page politically during a great crisis going on. You still have people making names for themselves and eating ice cream and, and running around and making laughing jokes about people that are trying to correct things out. It's just like a church on a giant scale that individuals are, I'm going to hold to myself, I don't care if it kills people, I don't care what anybody says. You can't get people united under that. You think you're going to get people united as a nation and get God to smile on this nation again? Hey, you've been preaching about it for a long time. Judgment's coming, judgment's coming. But you thought it was going to be a Rambo war kind of a thing. And now all of a sudden, judgment's come on the nation. God fooled everybody with this thing. You thought you had it figured out. It was going to be an atomic bomb. I've heard that preach. You thought it was going to be dirty bombs. I've heard that preach. You thought it was going to be an infiltration by UN troops and, and uh, martial law and a takeover and all that kind of stuff. He's got everybody scrambling and kept in their houses. You don't even have to have troops on the street to keep you there. That's why we need to rebel against the government. Okay, well, help yourself. Have a good time. If that's the hill you want to die on. In the meantime, I got work to do. I got things to do rather than get out and shoot my mouth off. I learned a long time ago, my daddy made a statement to me, I never forgot it. He said, put your brain in gear before you put your mouth in gear. But ladies and gentlemen, you know what he said you ought to be thankful for? You ought to be thanking God for that virus. You ought to be thanking God for the sickness in your body. You ought to be thanking God for the pain that you have. You say, why? God said all things work together for good, don't they? I know I'm in Sunday school, but you gotta, you'll appreciate this during the morning service because it'll help turn me down a little bit. I'm wore out. With carnal Christians worrying about carnal things, earthly things, worldly things. Oh my God, what's going to happen if my lifestyle doesn't reset to what it was before? It'll never be what it was before. But you know what it is? God looks at that thing and He said, My goodness, man, ain't that something? My people down there, the church, the bride of Christ, look at them, man. Scrambling around for, table, uh, for scraps underneath the devil's table. Worrying more about carnal things. It's Genesis 3 all over again. You want me to show you how I know that? In Genesis chapter number 3, Eve saw the tree was good for what? Food. She's looking at the tree because she said it would be something that will make me feel satiated, make me feel good. So now what do you have them doing? Oh, they're destroying food. They're killing off chickens and killing off eggs and, and going out into the fields and dumping gallons and gallons and gallons, thousands of gallons of milk. And, you know, and now the meat's in trouble and this and that and the other. I've told you for years around here, that thing starts with food and it ends with food. That thing in Genesis chapter number 3, she saw the tree was good for food. She fell by something that she ate. You don't go 40 chapters and now you got Joseph in there. What? He got the keys to the corn crib and you have seven good years and seven lean years and he's feeding people and there's food showing up again. You get Elijah the Tishbite. What happens? The food dries up again. There's a famine in the land and Elijah goes over there by the brook and the Lord feeds Elijah while he's there. You don't go hardly anywhere. All The next thing you know, you got Ruth and Naomi and they go over there to Moab. You know why? There's a famine in the land. You know what happens? He said, I want to come back to the house of bread. You end up that thing and, and start off in Matthew chapter by four. You got Jesus Christ. He goes out. You know what the first temptation is? The first one? You're reading your Bible, I'm sure, during this time. More than you're watching CNN, HBN, HBO, whatever you're watching, Fox and all that. You know what happens? He comes over there. He said, why don't you turn the stones into what? Bread. Starts with food. You know what happens during the tribulation? I mean, for and, and I'm sorry, I, I, should, I, I back up. Let me get in lamentation. In lamentation, the famine is so great because the city's under siege that they're selling a dove's dung. I don't need to give you a plainer translation, do I? Dove's, dove's, uh, Doug's uh, 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 word, uh, uh, excrement. Waste product out of the back end of a dove. You got the picture? They're selling a tin can of that right there for people to eat for sustenance. You got uh, Isaiah laying over there, and uh, I mean Ezekiel laying over there, and the Lord says to him, He says, "You're going to lay on your side for this amount of time and cut the back end out of your garment, and so, and uh, you're not going to eat anything." Well, I tell you what, I'm going to do. I, I want you to eat dung. Don't you believe these jackleg preachers that tell you that was what he used to heat his food up? There wasn't any food. It's a picture of the Jew in the tribulation. But you know what he does? He goes over there and he said, "Well, Lord, I don't want to eat human waste." He said, okay, I'll do you a favor. You read your Bible. Check me out. Make sure you're right. Send me your cards and letters and keep me rolling on here. But you know what he says in there? He said, Lord, I don't want to be eating human waste. I mean, the idea, the thought of that, that'll gag a maggot. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you cow dung. 
but you can't tell them it's cow dung. They're going to think you're eating human waste. You say, why? Starving to death. Food. Matthew 4, the Lord, food. By the time you get into the book of Revelation, you know what happens? In the book of Revelation, one of the horses that's riding, not just bring plagues, fam brings, uh, plagues famine. People starving to death cut off a donkey's head and sell on the donkey's head in the street and the pennies and the money and the gold is all cankered. It's not worth anything. You say, why? Starving to death. That thing starts with food, sure as I'm here, and ends with food, sure as I'm standing here. And so what do you have now? Uh, food supplies being, you know, concerned and barred. You say, why? You used to go into the store. But now you see what it's like. You find out you don't drive as much of it as you think you drive. You say, why? They've had it open where you can still go to the grocery stores and the grocery stores can't even hardly stay in business. You're not paying attention. You say, well, what do you mean? If it wasn't for the restaurants buying food and stuff like that, he wouldn't be keeping this country and the farmers rolling because they've been producing more food than they know what to do with. They sell it to them and then what they do is they export it to other places. And now that all the only people can buy it is for personal use and you cut down on the amount of people that can run by and get a takeout or whatever it might be, all of a sudden they got more food than they know what to do with. So what are they doing? They're destroying it. Preacher, you talk like a tree fell on you. Okay, well, I just read my Bible. I think it's going to have you say, why? And you get a person that's hungry, you can control them. You get a person that's hungry, that book teaches you clearly that in that time period, if you wanted medical attention or if you wanted to be able to get something to eat, if you don't have the mark, you can't eat. That means if you're listening to me this morning already for Sunday school and you're not saved, you're a cotton-picking idiot. You're a fool. If you think that you can go by without a, a, a full belly, if you think you can go by and not be able to eat and say, well, okay, all right, all right, maybe not you. How about your children? How about your wife? You're a Rambo, are you? You think you can go by and eat bugs out there and grab some mosquitoes flying out of the air and grab them with your chopsticks and, you know, throw them in your mouth? How long do you think you can live off mosquitoes and stuff like that? You won't last 30 days. You'd be so emaciated you can't even pick up a gun. You can't even pick up a rifle. You can't even uh, go out in the woods and hunt for food and stuff like that. You say, why? Well, starving to death, starving to death, starving to death. That's the last church. It starves to death spiritually. It goes into apostasy spiritually. I'm coming to Timothy in just a minute, but this is important for you to grab a hold of. It's important for you to know that if you study war, and you have to study it a little bit, you have to pay attention, that's God's judgment on man on sin here. And during the Civil War, uh, the biggest issue that happened was when the North overwhelmed the South, and they did, when they poured through like water through a sieve, and they did, that one of the things that you find out in reading the historical accounts of what was going on was not that just the guns and ammunition. Uh, they had had the ability to shut off the Mississippi River coming north to bring supplies in. Guess what they were bringing in? It wasn't ammunition like everybody tries to make it out to be. You know what it was? The troops were starving to death and they were improperly clothed. The surrender at Appomattox, you know what the biggest thing was with that? The troops were so emaciated they could hardly hold on to their muskets. They certainly couldn't stand at a picket. They were so emaciated all they could do was lay around. You ever tried to fast more than a day or two at a time? You ever try to fast for say a week or ten days? Or maybe a little longer than that? Do you realize how weak you get? Do you realize how things get, get kind of twisted and all of a sudden you get to thinking what's really important and you get dizzy every time you get up? Imagine being out in the elements and that going on and being improperly clothed. Don't have shoes for your feet, a shirt for your back or the britches you're wearing got holes in it. You say, what are you doing? The thing's setting up. You think this is the end? I don't know. I hope so. But if it was, you've been praying to see the Lord, suppose this is all part of the grand scheme of things, and the Lord's like, well, if you want me to come, <laughs> this is coming first. But nowadays, you know what's happening? Many of you, all your mind is on is what's going on in the world and what's going on here. And nobody has figured it out yet. I've talked, talked to some of the greatest biblical minds, I think, in my life, and I say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you, what do you see? And what do you think? And you know what they tell me? I honestly, these are the ones that are honest. These aren't the ones that are, you know, well, uh, what this really is, is, you know, I'm not talking about those guys. Uh, those guys are a legend in their own mind. I'm talking about people that are balanced, people that have been around a while, people that have been in this, and they're not just a, an upstart, a wannabe, and that kind of thing. You know what they say? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I said, well, I'm, I ain't got it figured out either. What do you think about it? I don't know, but I'm smart enough to say, I don't know. 
instead of shooting my mouth off and telling you, well, this is exactly what it is, and then find out two weeks later that you're completely wrong and it's not anything at all about what you said. Could I ask you a question just real quick? I digress and I confess that I do. What is your interest in finding out what this is instead of getting closer to Jesus Christ? What is your interest on picking up the Bible and trying to find some new thing like the Athenians over in the book of Acts and trying to find something somebody else has never found before or see something nobody else has found before instead of just working on the things that you do know? I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to me. Now, you may be different than I am, and those of you listening, you may be different than I am. People go to the Bible and you know what? I'm looking for some new thing. That's what got the Athenians in trouble. You know, well, there's no revelation. Listen, everybody that got revelation in the past, they got it by digging into things in the present and in the past. They didn't get future revelation by going and looking for future revelation. You say, why? You get revelation by turning over the ground that's already been turned over. You don't go looking for that. You say, why? You can find whatever you want to find in the Bible if that's what you're looking for. That's why when you come to the Bible, you confess your stupidity and say, Lord, you show me what you want me to see. Not, Lord, show me something new so that I can write a paper. I can write a book. I can get out there and show the people what a great revelation I have. You know, the greatest Bible teacher, as far as I'm concerned, and going way back before Larkin and Schofield and all that and coming on into the, our time period and all the other people who had things that God showed them and Martin Luther and going, going back in history and that kind of thing. You know, the greatest Bible teacher that I ever, ever sat under, that would be Dr. Ruckman for those of you that are uh, afraid of that. You know what the strangest thing to me in the world is? Is that probably five things that he discovered while he was just studying his Bible and teaching the Bible, he didn't go looking for them. Eternal security, standing in state, fellowship and sonship. Yes, marriage, divorce and remarriage. Uh, the fact that you're not in the vine and you can get cut out of the vine. And if you really are, you wouldn't be, which I'm going to get to in a couple of hours here and that kind of thing. You know, the odd thing about it is he never did that to try to say, look what I found. Look what I found. Look what I did. And you have one or two guys that run around and they find one thing that the great Bible teachers don't find. And all of a sudden that becomes their only thing. It's in every sermon. It's in every teaching. It's there. They're always, they show up at a meeting and they want to give you out their latest work of oh, what I found and, and I saw this and nobody's ever seen this before. Well, the Bible said nothing new under the sun. Are you the prophet? Are you Elijah? Are you Jeremiah? Are you Isaiah? Who are, who are you? Moses? Who are you? Show up and think, you know, well, that guy was around all these years, but he didn't see it all. Okay, well, it makes you think that the Lord's not done with that. What makes you think? I realize there's gradual revelation. I get that. I understand that. But you know how you get it? By applying the things you know how to do. You find the will of God on the road to duty. And what should you be doing right now? I'm going to show you here in the book of Philippians. The problem is your picture in your mind produces actions. Look, thoughts produce deeds. Deeds produce habits. Habits Produce an eternal or a destination. So if I got the wrong picture to start with, I'm going to wind up in the wrong place to end with. It's that simple. You need to change the picture in your mind. You need to change what it is that you're looking for, what it is that you're seeing. You know what you can see oftentimes? You see individuals who are using the Bible as a tool to try to get a following or try to get people to, to, to look after them or to admire them or to try to get a degree or whatever it might be. And all they're doing is using the Bible like a man that digs ditches uses a shovel or like a mathematician uses a pencil. A pencil. They're using the Bible to develop a reputation. Now, the Bible's given to us as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. That Bible is never turned around for you to turn that light on you and say, Oh, look what I got. I'm, I must be spiritual. Look what God gave me. You say, well, you're being awfully arrogant and sarcastic. No, but that's what you see going on in the latter days. That's what you see going on right now. In a time when people need help, they need strengthening, they need encouraging in the things they need to know. Not whether or not, you know, there's going to be a UFO flying down out of the sky or what's going on with this plague and what's going on with the locust and what's going on. You know what they need to know? What about now? What about now? What are you supposed to do? I'm trying to encourage preachers today and to tell you, preach Jesus for a while. How about that? How about you just preach Jesus? Uh, you can see somebody that's badly injured or whatever and looks like they may or may not make it in that kind of a deal and you get down there and go, oh, oh, this is terrible. I'm just being honest with you. You ain't going to make it. This is really, really bad. Why can't you just comfort them? 
Why don't you use it as an opportunity to take advantage of them while they're in a state of being fear, afraid and scared and uncertain and panic and anxiety. Oh, bless God, they should be like me. Well, help yourself, Rambo. Jump on out there and lead the pack, okay? I mean, get at it. In the meantime, uh, the rest of us little old paupers, the rest of us little old uh, weak-kneed and feeble-minded old men are just trying to just throw out a little sheep food, just throw out, a, just braid it, lead them to a pasture, let them graze a little while, graze a little, just eat a little while, try to knock off a wolf here, try to knock off a bear here and a lion there, just try to feed them a little while, try to keep them dry when it's raining and, and try to get them a little water when they're thirsty and that kind of thing. Oh, oh, how weak. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead and lead them, lead them right on into battle, man, and let them get slaughtered. People need help and encouragement now. Now, at least let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. Make sure you get what I'm about to say before you turn off that cotton pick and internet. For me, what the Lord, I believe, has led me to do is to try to comfort and feed the sheep. That old preacher used to tell me all the time, I'd say, Preacher, what about preaching this? And Preacher, what about preaching this? And Preacher, what about preaching this? And Preacher, what about this and that and the other? You know what he would say? Feed the sheep. Feed the sheep, feed the sheep, feed the sheep, feed the sheep, feed the sheep. And I'd say, well, I was thinking about and so on and so on and so forth and this and that and the other. I tended to lean hard and heavy too hard the, other, the, the wrong way. And he'd say, get you some messages on God's love and God's mercy and God's grace and God's long suffering. Get you some messages on the attributes of God that are not judgment. I realize that there are judgments there. I realize he said reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering. I realize it's two thirds negative. I get that. I know the gospel is three quarters negative. I get that. I understand that. I get 100%. I realize we tend to lean more toward the positive than the negative. But maybe could I just implore? Could I just ask you? Could I just pitch a question out there? Is now the time to be raking people over the coals? When they're losing their jobs and their family members are sick and they're afraid to go outside and they don't, they're uncertain of their future as far as economics are concerned, and things, is now the time to be raking them over? Or is now the time to say, come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden and I give you rest? I don't have answers for all their physical problems, economically or otherwise. I'm supposed to give them spiritual food. That's what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Now, those of you that don't even know what I'm talking about or could care less what I'm talking about, forgive the rant. But I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in seeing people that I know in other places who have all of a sudden become a part of or participated in the panic. Now's not the time to panic. And Jesus is over there in the boat and, and uh, he's trying to get him a nap back there on some snapper or something laying on the back. Peter's fish laying there on the back and he's sound asleep. He's exhausted and he's wore out and he's tired. And they come to him and, Lord, care us not that we perish. What I love about the Lord is, is he never participates in their panic. He's always like this. Oh my God, thank you for waking me up. I, wow, I wasn't even aware this was going on. I, how dare me be sleeping? What are we going to do? You know what he said? Where's your faith? He rebukes them. Will you guys lay down a while? These guys can't handle a little pressure. Could you look so I can catch some sleep here? I'm in the body of God dwelling in a human fleshly body right now, and I get tired now. I never experienced this before. I was God. I never got tired before, never got sleepy before, never got hungry before. I never got frustrated before at people who got their eyes on elements instead of on me. I know, I realize this probably sounds a little bit harsh. Let me tell you what to think on. We'll have to break off here and... I don't know, now I'm debating on whether or not to give you the rest of 2 Timothy because there's so many things that are in there that are good. Look in Philippians 4. He said, with thanksgiving, let your requests, excuse me, be known unto God. And if you do those things in verses 5 and 6, or I'm sorry, 4, 5 and 6, there's rejoice there, your moderation there. Um, the Lord's at hand, careful for nothing. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. And go ahead and tell Him what you want. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds how? Unless you think it's a rambling uh, uh, a conversation of a senile old man. Like a preacher recently said about my, my friend, the old preacher. He's just a senile old man. Well, come talk to me, sonny boy, when you've been in the ministry 64 years. You sure are mighty bold to make that kind of a statement when you aren't even as old as he was in the ministry. And have endured what he endured you have no idea what might befall you in another week or two. You're acting as if you're already there. 
one of those, you know, well, I know for a fact, I know for sure that I'm saved, but I can't tell you that you're saved. You can't be saved, not to the uttermost, because we can't see evidence of it. One of those guys. Self-righteous. A senile old man, when you've been reading his material and cut your teeth on it, and you got rooted and grounded in him to begin with, and now you kick him under the curb like that? Boy, aren't you something. Pardon me for that moment there. He says, with thanks, and he said, the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now watch. Now he's going to give you something. Finally, brethren, what am I supposed to be doing right now, preacher? You're supposed to follow what he says in Philippians. Watch. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things, watch. True, honest, just, pure, lovely, uh-oh, <laughs> good report. Come if you will, please. we got just a couple more minutes. I hope this is helping you. If, if it is, say amen. And even if it scares your wife who fell asleep on the couch there by you, come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And your kids, you know, fall asleep and hadn't heard daddy say amen in a long time. Good. Holler amen out there. Run around the building a little bit. Loosen up. Get your eyeballs opened up. Listen to me for just a minute here now. You know what he said? And the peace of God keep your hearts and minds. What are you saying? He's saying that how you think controls the ability for you to have peace. I've watched some people go, uh, go, some people that have passed on. I've seen them go in different kinds of ways and not to go around so somebody thinks I'm boasting about the things I've seen and places I've been and the things I've done and there's always somebody who hasn't done those things who's like, I don't know why he tells them stories and stuff because they're part of my life. It's just to illustrate some things. I've seen some people go in some extreme, bad, horrible sets of circumstances that you probably can't even imagine, and I could paint you a picture of it this morning, but let it suffice to say, I've seen them in spite of the circumstances, I've seen them go out just like that, just calm as they can be. So, oh, well, it's the drugs, it's the medication, it's this, it's that, it's the other. What if it's their relationship with the Lord? What if they've been preparing for that for a long time? I've seen other ones, even Christians, petrified of breathing their last breath, scared to death of when they're going to leave here, scared to death of, what, of what's on the other side. Too late to make the changes now. You say, what is that peace that keeps individuals? It's how you think. This whole thing right now is being utilized to keep you upset, to keep you anxious, to keep you nervous, to keep you glued to that box so that all of a sudden they can get you, well, what happens? Uh, you've all heard the illustration before, at least they did when they taught us life-saving and stuff like that, and we had to go through all the drowning protocol and all that, which I was glad I learned that because of what happened at Fall Creek Falls years ago. At least I knew how to get the people out and do the stuff. But at any rate, uh, they taught us all this stuff in life-saving, including how to take your jeans off and tie knots in them and throw them over in case you wind up having to blow up like two little legs and you float on them and all that kind of a deal. And they taught us during this time of life-saving that it's reach, throw, row, and go. That was the commands. The old way is, is first of all, you reach. That doesn't mean with your hand. You get you a, a bar but next to the pool or you get you a log or you get you something. You reach first of all. If you can't reach them, you throw. You throw them a life ring. You throw them a rope. You throw them a, 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 a sea buoy or whatever. If you can't do that, jump in a boat and row out there to get them. Reach, throw, row, and then last but not least, the final thing you do is you go. If you got to go, you have to understand. And they showed us illustrations of, of good, well-known swimmers who when they get close to somebody that's drowning, that individual jumps on them and sinks them like you'd sink a pine straw because they're scared to death and they don't recognize they're in panic mode that you're there to try to help them. They think you're there to drown them. They see you floating and they're not floating. So you know what they do? They'll sink you in order to... To, uh, to be able to stay alive. That's called the doctrine of the floating pine straw. They see something floating, a pine straw, they'll reach out and grab that pine straw even though that pine straw won't help them. They'll see you coming to try to help them out and you better be able to if necessary. You have to be able to take control of them because you have to do what's good for them because they're not in their right mind. The people right now are not in their right mind. You know what they ought to see you? They ought to see you reaching. They ought to see you throwing. They ought to see you rowing. And last, they ought to see you going. What can I do to help you? How can I help you? Some folks came by the other day and we kept our distance and all that stuff and they called and you're going to be home for a minute and they came by and they brought this little uh, thing that goes out in the yard and stuff like that. You say, what's the big deal about that? That's reach, throw, row and go right there. That's just come by and encourage you, preacher. Miss you. Miss you and your wife. Hope you all are doing well. Just 
brought you by something. Not, not anything major deal, preacher, but we're just thinking about you. What is that? Reach, throw, roll, and grow. That's what you as Christians ought to be doing instead of, I got to get home. The news media is coming on. I got to get home. What about this? I got to get home. I got to check this. I got to get, I got to, I got to get, I got to stay in here. I got to, I got to hunker down. Okay, well, why don't you reach out to people? You say, well, we can't do them. Okay, then throw them a lifeline. Send them a letter. Send them an inter- send them a send them a card. I got some cards this week. People just send in cards. Just scratch on the bottom. I'm thinking of you. Love you all. Praying for you. That kind of a thing like that. Text message. Email message. I don't mind getting those at all. I appreciate it. You do that for other people. That's what the Lord does. Now watch this thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now I realize I've gone over, but what's new? Notice what he says, verse number three. Can you grab a hold of this now? Watch. He says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. How? After the flesh. And he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He's talking about Christians. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, how you think, how you imagine things are going to be, how it's going to work out. Oh, I'm just, just not really sure. And I heard this and I heard that and I heard the other and, and so on and so forth. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having all readiness to revenge all disobedience when the obedience is fulfilled. You know what that's saying to you, ladies and gentlemen? It's saying that the way that you think directly affects how you act. And the way that you act eventually produces habitual behaviors and eventually those habitual behaviors produce you a destination in the end of that thing. And you wind up because you started out with the wrong picture. Now all I'm trying to do here, and I don't mean to be terse or hard or, or difficult with you in a difficult time. All I'm trying to do is, is to try to help to encourage you. Uh, get your mind off of all the things that are going on. Be careful. Pay attention. Walk circumspectly. But pause. It's Sunday. Let's regather our thoughts this morning. Let's get our mind on Jesus Christ. Like between the, the break here, between the time in between the Sunday school uh, and the church service, let's do like the men do all the time and go out there and pray. Let's spend some time praying. With faith. Guys, listen, be a great time to we'll get your family around you. Be a great time for y'all to get down there and kneel by the couch or the easy chair or whatever and say, hey, you know what? Let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray for the church. Let's pray for the preacher. Let's pray for the people. Uh, let's pray for that. Let, let's don't pray about all the other kind of things because we don't know what's going on there. How's God using it? I couldn't tell you. But what can I do? I can look at my own relationship and I can re restore that relationship with my family and those that are closest to me. Heavenly Father, I pray that you might bless what's been said this morning. Thank you for the privilege of being here. We'd ask your blessings upon the service as it's coming upon us. Lord, thank you for the faithful people that have been coming here, for some of them for 30 years or better. I thank you for those that are sitting at the house and give glory to the Lord for continuing to take care of them, especially our elderly congregation and people that can no longer gather with us but watch consistently on a regular basis. I pray, God, your blessings upon them. Keep a hedge of protection around their houses and around the things that they're doing and help them, Lord, to stay well until the day that you see fit to come get us. We'd ask now your blessings upon this little break and then upon...